Hello, I'm Bridge. I work as a chief architect for uh, a voucher server at Ericsson. And uh, in this session, we'll discuss productizing a Spark and Cassandra based solution in telecom. So this is the broad outline of what we will be discussing. So we'll discuss what is productizing, a brief about the product to get the context, and the challenges in productizing the solution and the evolution to handle those challenges, and then operations and maintenance challenges, followed by the wrap-up. OK, I've just taken an analogy from Iron Man. So what you see over here is Tony Stark, who is in captivity. So here we have, he has a need. What is there? A design is built, that's the invention of arc reactor, whilst he is still in captivity. And then the prototype, the armor Mark I which is good enough to address the need at the moment. And then the full solution, which has a lot of other features, the Iron Man suit, like it can fly and more robust, everything. And then comes Jarvis. That's the support mechanism, which is very important for any, when you productize anything. And once Jarvis is there, through which anyone can control the suit, you have another person managing the suit. So James Rhodes can also handle the suit, which we call an Patriot. OK. What we see is that there are two phases to it. One phase is that where we identify the need, put together a solution, handle the core issues, and then the second phase, where we like put together a mechanism so that it can be handled by others as well, apart from the inventor. So prioritizing is to take the solution to a level where one can just buy the solution and install it and use it by himself without any dependency on the team which built the solution. OK, I'm just putting together another illustration that how our voucher server went through that journey. We'll discuss in detail in the coming slides. So here, again, market sources created a need that we, our solution needs to be more scalable. We had to reduce cost. We had to improve the performance. OK, that need gave rise to a design where we do away with Oracle and we go for a Cassandra-based solution. Now, this solution, which is Cassandra-based, is highly scalable. And it can handle the refill request for top-up. And then we put together the whole solution where we are able to handle the reporting scenarios as well using Spark jobs. And then comes the support mechanism, which is a strong support team. And we'll discuss uh, as we go on that when we say strong support, what exactly we are talking about. And that makes it possible that you can have several installations worldwide and a single R&D team can handle that. That's the productized solution. So whole idea is that it's not a solution or a portal built by the <coughs> development team and managed by that company itself. The whole idea is that you have productized it, anybody can install it and use it. OK, so that was productizing. Now a brief about uh, what is a voucher server. So it's a very simple thing. In two sentences, I can say that, OK, it generates the activation code, which you use to top up your account as a pre prepaid uh, subscriber. And uh, whenever somebody uses that uh, code, it comes to the voucher server. It interprets the code 
and tells what is the currency and what is the denomination of this uh, voucher. Fairly simple. Now, another illustration just to give you an idea that what all DB operations are happening here, which makes the task challenging. So, okay, first we do the voucher generation. Voucher generation, they go into a file and go to the print shop. Nothing goes to the database yet. Then they go; for, they are printed and go to the retail shop. And that's when we load it. So it is to optimize the space utilization because volumes are big when we are dealing with vouchers. So whenever, the moment they reach the retail shop, that's when we load them in the database. And then they are sold, and the time they are ready to be sold, their state has changed. That means we change it from unavailable to available so that we can reduce the possibility of fraud within the supply chain. And once they are sold, of course, top-up requests will start coming from the subscribers. And voucher server has to interpret them. And we need a scale here because there will be several requests coming per second. And once a voucher is used, it needs to be purged. It's good for nothing. And other flow is that you need, you need to generate reports for various purposes, which is a batch processing job. So overall, as you can see, it is a quite a DB-intensive program, and that's why we are talking about Cassandra and Spark here. Okay. Challenges and evolution of this product. So we have, uh, so just to give you an idea, when we talk about this design change, what was the earlier design, and how does it look like once it moves to Cassandra? Now, here you have a refill request which comes in and goes to a cluster. And cluster has business logic. It has Oracle rack, which has a pool of voucher. But there's a constraint that, uh, overall, it's a good solution, but constraint is with the size. Now, one cluster can support only 300 million vouchers. And as I told you, the scale is important here. Voucher capacity is important. So if somebody needs more than uh, 300 million vouchers, then he has to go for second cluster. Now, it has a different pool. That means these pool, there are two different pools. A voucher which exists here does not exist there. So that's why when we are sending the riffle request, we need to have some sort of logic to route it. So typically, it, it is done that, OK, based on the first digit. If first digit is within this range, go to this cluster. If first digit is within this range, go to this cluster. And you have to load the vouchers also keeping that rule in your mind. And so you can see that uh, here we have a possibility of hotspots because it's based on the digit, the routing within the, across the cluster take place. And quite possible at some time, some of the vouchers, there are too many vouchers with one particular range and other cluster is not utilized properly. So we go to Cassandra, and now the thing changed that we have a single cluster. And now you don't have to worry about that kind of routing. So latency of that routing goes away. And you can just use round robin to uh, spread the load. But here we faced a problem that uh, report generation became a problem here. So as a prototype, it worked pretty well, was able to address all the improvement criteria. But reporting where we need full table scan, there we have the problem. So OK, let's see what is there in the reporting which makes it a tricky job in this solution. 
Here we have uh, a lot of the operation along with the report. So one report is there which is there for state distribution. Here what we, it is primarily used for reconciliation of uh, the voucher usage and the report tells you that okay at this moment all the voucher among all the vouchers which are loaded uh, these many are unavailable, this many are available, these are used, these many are damaged, these many are marked as stolen, that kind of information so that based on the usage report you can uh, do sort of reconciliation and check for fraud etc. And so other report is that you pull out the information and put it in some analytic solution for fraud detection and market prediction, that kind of thing. So here, the main uh, issue is that report generation requires full stable scan. In the first case, report is small in size, but still it requires full table scan. That means going to each and every node. And in the second case, the amount of data which is pulled out is pretty huge. So before the before we introduced Spark into it, solution looked like something like that. We are from the web interface. A request comes for report generation, comes to Java, and Java talks to the Cassandra directory, entire cluster, gathers information, does the full table scan of all the vouchers in the system across all the nodes. And what we see is that uh, here, since all the data is being pulled into one node and then you are generating the report, of course, out of memory exception is a possibility here and it also reduces the performance. So alternative design is that either you build your own distributed computing mechanism or you go for some framework. So this was what happens when we bring Spark into the picture. Here, again, same thing, but this time Java talks to Spark. And Spark distributes the job into the Spark executors, and they talk to Cassandra and generate the report. Here, the important part is that with Cassandra, when Spark talks, we are leveraging data locality. That means if uh, data is partitioned across all the nodes and we need some mechanism so that when the two processes which are co-located in the node, they talk to each other more often rather across the nodes. So that is what data locality is and here we get that, uh, 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 we'll see in the next slide that how we get it and uh, network latency is minimized here and performance is excellent. In fact, the results across the previous design and this design, we had a 99% improvement in the performance. So here, a word on data locality, which I mentioned earlier. So the way things happen is that your Java-based business logic, it links with the uh, uh, Spark Cassandra connector. That is, uh, okay, ours was Java implementation, so we had to put a Java wrapper, which also comes off the shelf. And then that talks to Spark executors on, say, for example, in this case, we have three nodes. So, say there are th one executor per node. And then there is a one Cassandra instance on each of the nodes and data is being pulled by each executor in the from the local Spark Cassandra instance. And here as you can see there's little confusion with the way we talk about partition because in Cassandra partitions are different and Spark meaning of partition is different. So in Cassandra the way data is distributed across the instances of Cassandra that is referred as partition, whereas in Spark, there are small pieces of data which is within the uh, same node, that is the partition. So here, 
But the interesting part where data locality comes into the picture, when a Spark partition is loaded in a node, it is loaded from the data from the uh, Cassandra partition on the same node. It is not loaded from the other uh, uh, node. And this intelligence is there because of the Spark Cassandra connector, which makes the performance excellent. So okay, those were the issues and the evolution. And uh, now we move to the operations and maintenance challenges. Here, the key thing is that since we are dealing with a new set of technologies, that's why we are facing these challenges. With the traditional solutions, which, is, which are Oracle-based or something, all your capabilities of, uh, say, DB administration and all those tuning various things are locally present with the service providers. And based on the bulk of things they are doing, the pattern they are using the product, they can tune it themselves. But when they are dealing with Cassandra, Spark, these technologies, that skill set is not there with them. They are not used to these products yet. And that's why productizing becomes a bit challenging. So here, some of the challenges uh, which we face uh, are Cassandra repair, lagging compaction, and then handling real-time traffic along with Spark jobs. So just to give you a flavor of uh, when we say Cassandra repair issue, what exactly it is. So we have three nodes over here, three Cassandra nodes, and it has some data. And I say that value of that field is A in those three nodes. There are three nodes, and say the application factor is three. So there are three copies in the cluster. So what happens? A new request comes, which says that, OK, change the value from A to B. OK, it is accepted. And on that node, A is replaced replaced by B. Now, this node becomes the coordinator, sends this to node 1, and there also it is accepted, and A is replaced by B. Now, same thing, same message is sent to node 3, but for some reason, say, there is a mutation drop. For example, node 3 is down at that moment, that's why that change could not happen. Or, Say there's a, some, because network latency or something, some error happens. So this is a situation. Now, what happens because of this is that you have uh, inconsistency of data across the cluster. Two nodes have value, new value, and one node still has the old value. Cassandra will not give you problem with this because we follow typically quorum as the consistency level, as long as two nodes out of three, they respond with the right value, everything works smooth. But problem happens later when you have, uh, say, one of the node, but one of the node with the current data goes bad, or there is a concept called uh, GC grace period that expires. So in that case, the flip side, if system remains like this, the flip side can be that's Sometime your data, uh, your request may fail because there may not be two instances to make the quorum for the correct value. And in one of the cases, some of the deleted records may, be, uh, may reappear. And the solution, which is a standard solution for this problem, is that run the Cassandra repair jobs in the background. Very simple, but what happens in the field is that customer community, they don't know what is repair because they can't map this to anything in RDBMS world. And that's why a lot of time what happens, repair jobs are not scheduled even though they are in the manual, but for some reason they are missed out and at times for prolonged periods repair is not done and these inconsistency keep on building in the system and start creating the problems. That was the first challenge. Second challenge is lagging compaction of Cassandra SS tables. Here, what happens is that whenever a request comes, an SS table is re 
created in the hard disk, and that's how Cassandra works. It creates, uh, and similarly, if your replication factor is three, all three nodes will have one as a stable for that particular information. For the same record, for the same voucher in this case, if another uh, request comes changing its value, another SS table is created across all three nodes. And that keeps on happening as long as changes are coming. Now what happens is that uh, you have uh, a lot of SS table. So what happens in Cassandra, there is a Cassandra compaction which happens in the background. But the problem is that sometimes some of the service providers who use our solution, they have a very different pattern. For 15 days, they don't do anything with the system. And suddenly on the 15th day, they uh, update 200 million vouchers. And that's why what happens is that some of the SS tables are so huge that they don't si find any other SS table of similar size so that compaction could happen. And that means that uh, keep on uh, these SS table are this uh, never free up the memory and this keeps on, uh, keeps on increasing the disk utilization and that's the challenge. And sometimes they ignore this uh, so much that the uh, red flag is raised only when 85% of disk utilization is already there. Other challenge is that we have to handle real-time traffic along with Spark jobs. So here, in a peak time, distribution is like this. Most of the time, it is the refill request which we handle, and admin jobs are very little. And in the off-peak hours, your Spark-based jobs are, they consume more of the, most of the resources, but still you have to maintain the off-peak traffic, because even at the midnight, somebody might be trying to refill his, top up his uh, prepaid balance. Now here, uh, Spark consumes so much of resources that even the, handling the uh, off-peak traffic becomes a challenge. And that's, we figured out that if we tune Spark executor cores, that can help you in dealing with this challenge. So okay, in short, basically, uh, these are the challenges. So you have to monitor, uh, you have to schedule, uh, monitor the time elapsed since last uh, successful Cassandra repair with respect to GC grace seconds and on each node. And for logging compaction, you have to monitor some of the things like disk utilization, SS table count, and you have to monitor the CPU utilization, throughput, all those things for all this. So as you can see, some of the monitoring is required. Now moving to the wrap up. Here, if you summarize all the things we, dis we discussed. So first phase, technical issues. Here we say that for high scalability, use Cassandra. For full table scans, use Spark, which leverages data locality. And in the second phase, we say that the lack of admin skills among the end users leads to some of the problems. That's repair, compaction, and running real-time traffic along with batch processing jobs. So how to solve this problem is that you need to have an active development. Active development, that means you don't take care of just the business logic, but you poke into the issues which may come up with the technologies you're dealing with. Don't expect that customer who is using the system will be able to tune your system yours, himself and handle the situation because they won't do it, they don't have the skills, and you are the person who are selling this product, and you have to anticipate those problems and make your system robust for that. So you have to tune Cassandra and Spark to handle all this uh, unusual patterns, the way I explained that there is a prolonged period of inactivity and suddenly too much of activity, what that can lead it to. And then you need to have certain tools which help them in monitoring. So since off the shelf, all these monitoring is not available for these technologies as a fit. So you may have to develop your own solution dashboards which focus on these technologies rather than just on the business logic of your system. And the most important, the Jarvis part of it, 
that you need to train your support team. It cannot be just who note down the problem and later on do it. They should be, it, this team has to be, have to have skill set on Spark and Cassandra so much that they can augment the incapability of the end users in the knowledge and they can partner with them to, for the smooth operations of Cassandra and Spark. So here, just an illustration what the strong support is that. Developer, they train on what is Cassandra, what is Spark, what can go wrong. If this go wrong, this is there. So they don't work just in, on the routing the problem, rather they are able, they have the skills to understand the problem and go to, into the technicality themselves and then they can partner with the customer to solve the problems. And if you have the strong support, which is skilled enough to partner with the customers, then you are ready to productize your solution and run global deployments with multiple customers from a single R&D lab. With this, I come to the end of the discussion. Any questions? Thank you. Hi, I have a question. So actually, uh, if you use uh, Cassandra and Spark together, and let's say that uh, that's me. Uh, let's say that uh, Cassandra, for example, repair command is typically weekly or two weekly basis. And let's say maybe there is some data that's incorrect that came to Cassandra, but repair is not yet executed. Let's say it's uh, the data came in between two repair commands. Uh, have you seen uh, Spark? Uh, how do you deal in Spark with maybe incorrect data? From Cassandra. Uh, so just let me uh, tell you what I understand out of your question is that you, your repair could not run successfully, whereas uh, you are running the Spark job. Is that your question? Yeah, my question is there is a Spark job running that uses Cassandra uh, data, the data from Cassandra. And you receive the situation maybe what you described, uh, that maybe some nodes haven't received the right answer, May maybe quite many nodes, and the repair comment not yet executed. Have you seen such situations? Uh, since uh, Spark will deal with the, with the Cassandra cluster based on the consistency level, that's why though it tries to leverage data locality, but if that fails, it will it will do uh, go to the other nodes and uh, complete the query and as long as uh, if it, it is a three node cluster and uh, the local copy is uh, not good but other two copies are good it will it will definitely go for a quorum and complete that so it leverages data locality but doesn't completely depend on that if two copies are not good, then your consistency level should be, sh and replication factor should be tuned to take care. Typically, we say that your read uh, consistency level plus your uh, uh, write consistency level should be greater than the replication factor. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, I have a question cause, uh, regarding the uh, streaming and analytics uh, re requirements. So using one cluster for streaming and analytics, because we usually uh, separate it. We are using cluster for streaming and one cluster for analytics, and uh, we are doing uh, replication between them. So the problems usually occur if you are doing streaming and analytics with one cluster. Yeah, so that's a question. Yeah. Are you concerning to, to separate it or? 
It is recommended that you run it separately, but as the use case I discussed with you, we are running on the same node. Okay. And that's when you have to tune your course properly. You have to do your sizing in such a way that you are able to handle both kind of uh, uh, jobs in, uh, and your resources are uh, available for running both kind of uh, jobs. So you have to depend a lot on your tuning. It's not a recommended thing, but yes, if, if it is not a viable solution to have uh, separate nodes, you can tune it to work okay. this way. Thanks. Okay, I'm afraid we're out of time for questions. Um, please feel free to consult him uh, privately. Thanks. Thanks.